the first thing about debt is that it's very much guided by shame and by guilt and also by fear because a lot of the traditional financial advice you hear is very fear-based to make you feel like you have to do things a certain way. Hello and welcome to In The Rising Podcast. My name is Bettina Brown. And this is the platform I have chosen to talk about living a life that's really in alignment with your hopes, your dreams, and your goals, that you feel you have risen up through your own circumstance to get where you are, turning your back on shame and blame because it does nothing for you. And through this podcast, my goal is to share stories of other people overcoming a really difficult part of their life, relationship, or financial, or emotional, or even mental health. And my guest today is Alyssa Davis, and her brand new book, Financial First Aid, is now out. And she really shares the importance of addressing our own money trauma and how that can be holding us back. I'm really excited for you to hear Alyssa talk. I definitely got so many important nuggets of information that made me change my ideas about money. And I'm really eager for you as well. So welcome, welcome, Alyssa, to my podcast. I am I'm really happy to have you here because you are talking about a topic that um, I love to talk about, and that's money and how to have a better relationship with money, which I think many of us don't even think about money and and a relationship to it. Uh, We just think we either have it or we don't. But how did, where did this topic, like, why does this topic resonate with you to spend and invest the time to write a book about it and and continue (laughs) That's a really great question. For me, it's it it all kind of started at the beginning of the pandemic, to be honest. I was having really great conversations with my friends who were suddenly having to face the reality of where their money was at, or they were in relationships and realizing that they had a lot less independence and control that they needed to kind of feel confident and comfortable that if something were to happen to them tomorrow, they wouldn't know what to do. And as someone who suffers with anxiety, it was that moment for me of, okay, how am I going to help other people feel like they have that control back? Because that's the one area that matters to me is having some sort of control over the unknowns. Yes. And for a lot of us, the pandemic was a wake up call to really realize where our money is and where it's not. But you, in your topic, you talk about multiple sources of income. And I, when I've done my own research and gone through my own financial issues, I kept reading it and I'm like, but how many more jobs should I have? But, but, but describe that. What does that really mean? Yeah. I think a lot of us don't actually realize that we're doing better in that area than we think. Um, a lot of us actually have more streams of income. And if you don't have more streams of income, it's quite easy to set them up. It's accessible just through your online banking. Um, You can have, obviously we have our earned income, which would be our full-time income, but you can also have income through your interest that you earn by having a high high yield savings account. You can also have income you earn through investing for your future, which is such an easy and great way to win at money. And then obviously you can do that. You can have a side hustle and you can have that additional um, stream of income through working another job. But like you said, hustle culture exists and no one needs to feel obligated to do that. So start with those smaller, easier sources of income that you can grab and start to lift that up. I myself add like one stream of income a year. It sounds like maybe a lot, but once you get to that point where you're comfortable adding multiple streams, it becomes easier and easier to do. Mm-hmm. And, and there is a difference between earning for a dollar per hour per se and having money work for you. Yes. And, and, and so instead of working for it, and a lot of times we work for it when we're in a lot of debt and debt is, Sometimes we have that paycheck to paycheck because it's really, it's all you can do, but then you have this mounting debt behind you. Describe what you've learned through your own research and talking to people about debt, their relationships to it, et cetera. For sure. So the first thing about debt is that it's very much guided by shame and by guilt 
and also by fear, because a lot of the traditional financial advice you hear is very fear-based to make you feel like you have to do things a certain way and that you shouldn't be telling people that you have debt. It actually feels easier sometimes to walk up to a complete stranger and tell them how much debt you have than it would your own family member, because we've just created this kind of bubble of shame around the idea that debt isn't okay, when in reality, almost every single person you know will have some sort of debt whether it's their mortgage, their student loans, consumer debt from shopping too much. Um, Everybody has it. And learning to accept that it exists and that you have to manage it is a part of life. But finding ways to overcome that debt without feeling like you're a bad person for having it is really important. From from your experience, especially with the shame, the guilt, um... From my experience, I have I I'm a professional in the healthcare field. A lot of us have, you know, another mortgage worth of debt. We don't talk about the amount, but we have this. But do you feel that people carry this guilt with with their debt, so they don't really talk about money? Period, because of this one area. Absolutely, it's a form of money trauma. You would rather disassociate or reject the idea that there's anything happening with your money than actually face it and make a plan and do something about it because it's easier to just say, oh, it doesn't exist in my mind. So I don't have to worry about it today. But in reality, that's just a, it's a form of money trauma. You are not really sure how to take those steps to face that probably because maybe your family didn't speak about money when you were growing up. It has a lot to do with your upbringing and those kind of money topics that were spoken about or those things that we used to be told about money over and over again, like it's not okay to talk about money. What would you say about the money trauma that lingers? Is it like from household to household? Is this a generational thing? It can be generational for sure. It totally depends. You could be carrying money trauma from your grandparents or their grandparents, um, depending on how much it impacted your family. If you grew up in poverty it's really, really hard to break that cycle of thinking and existing in that kind of scarcity mindset or fear that we feel about never having enough. And I talk a lot about that in the book because I myself feel like that because when I was in debt, it became really difficult for me to imagine a life where this wouldn't happen again. Yeah. And you share your own story. You know, when I was really in a lot of debt, now you say I add an income stream every single year. (laughs) There is this potential. A lot of people feel maybe I'm saying it because I've been feeling that way myself in conversations. I definitely don't want to speak for people that it just seems so out of reach. What would be one step to get in the right direction? Because all of all the things you talk about is right, but it still can be overwhelming. Totally. And the one thing that's really important to acknowledge is we all have different barriers, Mm -hmm. different privilege that totally dictates how quickly you're able to overcome certain money challenges. So you're not alone and don't feel bad because other people are making progress faster than you because they have privilege that you might not have access to. And that's a really unfortunate part of life. And Something that I think is really important for anyone to do is stop that avoidance of looking at your bank accounts and getting to know your numbers, because that is step number one. You have to know how much money you have coming in, how much money goes out every month, and how much debt do you actually have? Because a lot of us are afraid to look at that whole number in its entirety, but you have to get to know your numbers to make any progress in your financial life. Yes. I heard once that looking at your bank account every day is as important for someone trying to get a financial hold as it is for someone to weigh themselves every day. Not that the weight will come off, but to just be comfortable with looking at your weight. You cannot face or go through what you cannot face, right? Yeah, totally. And I love when you talked about scarcity mindset where I I will work with people who grew up in the great depression, who just seem to be doing very well. (laughs) Um, And, and, you know, they're, they're, they're moving on, but they watch, you know, they're living in these really beautiful retirement homes that cost four or five, $6,000 a month and everything's paid off. And then I, I have the baby boomers who I will see and they stuff duct tape on their floor to like, keep it together. What do you think 
we are right? Where do you think we are at this kind of generational juncture at this moment? I think we're experiencing that in a different sense. I think that the supply chain right now is scaring a lot of us into feeling like there's never going to be enough. I think that's just how our society kind of exists is that is the way it goes. You ne- you'll you never feel like you have enough. I don't think that that's possible because we value assets in it, in their entirety. And if you can't get assets and if you can't continually accumulate assets, you feel like you're not doing enough. It's the same as kind of feeling like you have to hit those milestones every single year or by a certain age. Like those things aren't true, but we still believe them in our, in our minds and in our hearts that we have to own a home by a certain age, get married by a certain age when those traditional milestones may not be for you and you may not ever want to accomplish them. And you don't feel like a whole person because you don't have them. So it's kind of learning to unlearn those money mindset or those things that we were taught growing up that aren't really a good fit for us today. And you, because you said this, the book prompted, you've been writing before, but this book came out of this pandemic. A lot of us realize we have one thing that's missing from our life. And that is called an emergency fund. That's more than five or $10. You go into more detail in your book, but share the importance of that and having, I never even heard of this, multiple (laughs) emergency funds. Yeah. So for me, it was like, I was, after I paid off my debt, hoarding money, I was afraid to spend money because of that feeling of never having enough. And it was a battle of like, things are going to happen, these unplanned expenses that in reality are planned. It's really unlikely you'll go through your entire life without facing some sort of financial emergency. And so I had this idea to compartmentalize those planned, unplanned expenses. So things like the four walls around me, like my home will eventually need updating. My home will eventually have an appliance breakdown. So if I have money saved for that, it's less worry for me. It's less likely to derail me paying my debt back or saving for another financial goal or investing for my future. And so the moment that I was able to fully fund those and those accounts and find numbers that made sense for those accounts was the moment that I actually felt financially free. Yeah. And that makes sense that to have a planned unplanned fund, because you know, your car will, the car you're driving at 30 will not last till you're 80. You know that, (laughs) you know, you're going to need a down payment, you know, all of these things and, and just to plan for it. And it doesn't have to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So we always hear, and, and I love Dave Ramsey, but you know, like just buy your car cash. I'm like, have you seen the, the price of a used car lately? <laughs> yeah, second. exactly. Um, like it's not $3,000 and it won't last long if it is, um, if you're not a mechanic. So what do you feel would be, you know, should someone have two accounts or three accounts and where do you feel is a good start? Like get one fund going or start all of them slowly? What, what, what are some advice? I think that it's totally dictated on what your lifestyle is like. If you have dependents, that will vary how much money you need to have saved. If you own a home, if you um, have a really old vehicle, like you mentioned, those things all kind of dictate how much money you need. You know, the typical financial advice is that you need three to six months of expenses saved in an emergency fund. And that's an amazing rule. But it's also not realistic for everyone. Some of us can't have that much money immediately. Some of us will need more than that to feel secure and to have that anxiety kind of melt away. So when you say how much should they have, how, when do they start, how much should they start with? Well, we all start with zero. So whatever amount you can afford to put away and however much money you can afford to put away, start there. It doesn't need to be massive. It doesn't need to feel like you're not doing enough. If you can't save more than $20 a month, that's amazing. That's a great place to start. That's where I started when I was paying my debt off. Um, because having that emergency fund is going to be what keeps you progressing in your life. So start small and eventually you'll get to the point where you can say, Oh, I'm finally feeling like comfortable enough that I could now split this fund into two funds because that makes sense for what my life looks like today. Um, but your money relationship and how you manage your money evolves throughout your life. So don't be afraid to change that as you go. I love that. It evolves as you go through life because your values are different. Your dependence yeah. may or may not be there. 
Exactly. You have so many great points. How can people learn about you, your book, Mixed Up Money? (laughs) Share about that. (laughs) For sure. So you can pick up financial first aid at any major book retailer, whichever one you choose. Um, And you can follow me on Instagram or any social media platform at Mixed Up Money, where I just, it's really judgment-free, shame-free money talk um, to make it more comfortable and get to know your financial situation without feeling like you're a bad person for not doing everything right. Cause none of us do, <laughs> or you can head to mixedoutmoney.com. And I have a blog there where you can read about any questions you might have about repaying debt or finding a new job. So like so many of my guests, I really got a lot out of my conversation. I'll be at short with Alyssa Davis, you know, talking about your relationship with money. We know that our relationship with money affects everything else. In fact, money issues are the number one reason for divorce. And one in two of us are getting divorced. So it's a huge, huge part of our life. And to address the elephant in the room may very well not only change our relationships and our divorce statistics, but our relationship with ourself. To not hide when we buy something, to not feel shame and not feel shame about our current situation and acknowledge that it may take us a while, but we can get that financial freedom, not from a get quick rich scheme, but with intention an intentional focus and one step after another. So if you feel that today's podcast would really help someone that you know, I ask you to go ahead and share it. It can do so much in the hands and ears of someone and make a difference and impact for their life. The other ask that I have is that you leave an honest review, which of course I would hope to be a five-star review on, on this podcast so that it can really increase its reach and change the lives of other people. So thank you so much for your time. I'm so grateful for it because time is something we do not get back. And until next time, let's keep building one another up.